Welcome to the worship services of the Gray Mirror Church of Christ. The next few minutes are designed to help you with everyday living, finding our answers from God's Word. The reading this morning is from Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses one through five. Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse one through five. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. It is truly a blessing to be part of a congregation that's active in the Lord's work. And I'm so thankful for everything that's taking place. I want you to know that there are several young men and their family members uh, that were here Friday, the young men that had been here all week, that are thankful especially for this congregation. Uh, The opportunity that's been afforded uh, to them to come to spend a week here, uh, to have classes that train them on how to put sermons together to have a chance to do that and be guided by different people. I can't tell you how many Friday night were just telling me how grateful they were for this congregation. And that was just exciting to hear people bragging on on Graymere, and I'm thankful for all the work that went into it. This was my first year, and so I had known but didn't really realize how many people are involved in making this a reality. And there are so many here that helped serve food and did all the little things and getting things prepared and ready uh, that I'm incredibly thankful for. And then to be thinking about the mission trip that's taking place to Purlington to encourage that congregation that Graymere supported for years and the opportunities that exist because of the aftermath of some tragedy and ways that, that people can be reached. That's just incredible to see people using their talents in that way. To think about what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks of camp as we have so many of our young people that will be involved there doing so many good things and learning things. To think about Chris and Aaron Webb and their family that's coming to join us soon as Chris will be working with our youth group. And uh, they're excited about that and we'll get to know them uh, better in the next few weeks. We're excited about having them as a part of this church family. There's just a lot that's taking place right now and it's a blessing to be part of the family of God that's having all of these opportunities before us. Uh, For the month of June, the passage we're going to be focusing on as kind of our uh, memory verse will be Proverbs 24, 14. Proverbs 24, 14. If you would, let's say this together. Know that wisdom is thus for your soul. If you find it, then there will be a future and your hope will not be cut off. Think about the importance of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. This will be a helpful verse for us to remember. If you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to turn to Galatians chapter 6. We'll be looking at these first five verses of Galatians 6 because we see here a very important lesson about responsibility. You've probably noticed that we live in a society where everyone has a right Everyone, everyone has rights, everyone has privileges, yet it's a temptation for people to push off responsibility on others. There's a story that's told by an individual named Bernard Brown Jr., who runs the largest health care provider in the greater Atlanta area, the Kennestone Regional Health Care System. And he tells a story about a hospital where he worked once, in which a patient was in bed and had reached over for a glass of water. He had a pitcher there that they'd poured a glass of water. He reached over for that glass of water. It fell, and there was water everywhere. And so he pressed the call button and called in the nurse and asked the nurse if she could clean this spill up. He was afraid that if he got out of bed, he would slip on it, or if somebody visited, they would slip on it. And the nurse said, well, actually, that's the responsibility of the nurse's aide. And so she called in the nurse's aide, and the nurse's aide looked at the spill and explained to the patient that the nurse's aides were responsible for the small puddles or spills in a room, but this was a large spill. 
And so the large spills were handled by the cleaning staff. And so she called a member of the cleaning staff who came up and saw the spill and declared that this spill was a small spill. And so the cleaning staff is usually responsible for large spills, but she explained to the patient, this is a small spill, so this is actually not my area. And so you have the nurse's aide there and the member of the cleaning staff there, and the nurse's aide says, well, this isn't my responsibility because this puddle is, is too large. And the cleaning staff member says, this isn't my responsibility because the puddle is too small. And the patient was so exasperated that he took the pitcher of water and he just poured it on the floor. And then he said, is this big enough for someone to clean it up and put it down? I think that story is humorous and it's used uh, as he speaks to companies, uh, Bernard Brown speaks to companies, to talk about the principle of responsibility. And I think all through life we see that tendency to try to shift responsibility to other people. We can even look back and see in the Garden of Eden what happened when Adam and Eve were confronted with their sin. You have this shifting of the blame or the shifting of responsibility. And so Adam is pointing to Eve, and Eve is pointing to the serpent. There's something in us that when we're faced with a challenge or we're faced with a task that might be undesirable, we're tempted to shift that responsibility onto someone else. And here at the conclusion of Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, he's dealing with a group that's struggling with uh, those that have come in, and they're teaching that in order to truly be a Christian, you have to follow not only the teachings of Christ, but also the Old Testament. And all, those, all that went with that, being uh, circumcised, uh, the dietary laws that went with that, and everything from that old law. And what they were doing was they were saying that the law of Christ wasn't enough. And so Paul is very clear about the true message of the gospel. And before he closes this letter, he points them to their responsibilities toward one another. And we're taking a a break this morning from our series on tough questions to think for just a few minutes about our responsibilities for each other. It's a good reminder for us to see these first five verses in Galatians chapter 6. I'd like for us to look through that passage that was just read for us and look at the instructions. There are two different kinds of responsibilities that we see here. When he writes, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. There's a collective kind of responsibility. That as we see those who are caught up in something they shouldn't be in, we have the responsibility to bring them back. But then he also says, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Well, there's an individual responsibility. I need to be examining myself. Bear one another's burdens. There's that collective responsibility. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work. There's that individual responsibility. And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. And so we see that individual responsibility again. You kind of sense back and forth that as Christians, I, I, we have responsibilities for ourselves, but also responsibilities toward each other. And so I'd like for us to think about both the collective and the individual this morning. We'll start by thinking about Paul's instructions to bear one another's burdens. There's that collective responsibility. It's, it's on all of us. It's laid on all of us to bear each other's burdens. One of the joys of being a Christian is the knowledge that we don't bear our burdens alone. No matter what we're dealing with, it's encouraging to know that we're not by ourselves. Even in difficult situations, if the presence of a friend or a family member doesn't change the reality of the situation, at least we know we're experiencing it with someone. There are several times in Scripture we find that those who follow God can cast their burdens on to Him that he, we serve a God who's big enough to take our burdens. The psalmist would write in Psalm 55, verse 22, Cast your burden upon the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. God can sustain us if we put our burdens on Him. Or even the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's a sense in which we know as we serve God, we serve a God who can take our burdens. 
I don't know if you've thought about how encouraging that can be lately. When we come together for a worship service, we don't have to leave our burdens outside. We can bring them to God. When we bow in prayer, we don't have to put all of our burdens that we're dealing with in life to the side. We can bring those to the Lord in prayer. The things you're dealing with at work, the things you're dealing with at home, the things that are happening at school, the things you're thinking about constantly or keeping you up at night, we can bring those to God. It it doesn't erase the reality of what we're dealing with, but we can know that God is with us. And then Paul says also that as Christians, we bear one another's burdens. We share our burdens with each other. A few weeks ago, we looked at, in our series of tough questions, we looked at some of the things that Christians have done in the name of God. And we discussed how when someone is an opponent of Christianity, when someone is looking for fault in the church or looking for fault in Scripture, it's easy for them to point to Christians who haven't lived up to the standard God has set and to say, see, look at that. If you need proof that Christianity isn't true, look at that. The other side of that coin... We know that Christians make mistakes. The other side of that is what Paul is dealing with here. When we see Christians that are bearing each other's burdens, that are taking care of the needs of one another, that when one is suffering, they're there to help them, that when one is struggling, they come alongside them. When we see Christians that are spending time caring for others and taking care of others, I don't know of any better argument or any better example to put before someone to say, here is why God's plan works because God created the church and God doesn't want any of us to struggle alone. And as was mentioned in the prayer earlier, we have those in our congregation that are struggling. It's actually a constant reminder every week as we look at our prayer list, how many different individuals and families are dealing with issues. And my question is, are we looking for ways to bear those burdens? As we continue to pray for the Winchesters, for Hema and Jonathan and the entire family, receiving some difficult news this week and dealing with those challenges, one thing I noticed was that earlier this week, without being asked or without being prompted, there were several members of this church family that took it upon themselves to try to find ways to help. Uh, to try to find things to do that could encourage. And I was thinking about this passage as I saw that happening. That's the blessing of the church. And that's not unique just to this week. That happens every week in this congregation. And we may not always know about it, and we might not always read about it in the bulletin or see it uh, firsthand, but it's happening. And as we think about this responsibility, we have the challenge to help bear one another's burdens. And as you look through the list of those who are sick or in need of prayer, I would challenge all of us to find ways that we can help bear their burdens. If you're not doing that, try to think of someone that you know that's in need and one thing you can do this week specifically to help bear that person's burden. And then there's another side to this. Paul also encourages them to restore each other, to restore those that are erring, that are caught up in spiritual sin. And that language indicating caught is the idea that there's really no excuse. There's there's no doubt what's happening, that they're caught in something. And it's not just a one-time sin. It's not just a one-time mistake. This idea is someone who is caught up in a pattern or a lifestyle of sin. And did you notice the instruction that Paul gives in verse 1? You who are spiritual... Go to that person. Restore one another. Did you notice that's not just for elders or deacons or ministers? Anyone who is spiritual falls into that category. We have the responsibility to help each other. And it's, it's for the purpose of restoration. Not just for condemnation. Not just for pointing out what someone's doing wrong. Yes, that's necessary if they're caught in sin for there to be any change. But the point is that they would be restored. The goal is that they would be restored, not that you would go and just condemn them and look what they're doing, but the goal is that you could help them see what's taking place and you could bring them back. It's important to realize that. And Paul also talks about that restoration taking place with gentleness or with meekness. As we read through Scripture, we see several times the importance 
of being gentle or being meek. And sometimes we associate those words with weakness or, or something that's, that's frail and that's not very sturdy. And yet we understand, Paul had said just a chapter earlier when he's describing the fruit of the Spirit, the way that we can see the Spirit working in our lives, one of those is through gentleness. I like the illustration that William Barclay uses about gentleness as he describes what you would do if you walked into a room and there was a window that was frozen shut. Let's say it was frozen shut from the inside. How could you get that window open? What could you do to make sure you could open that window? He said you could go in there and just chip away at the ice. That might take a while. It might be difficult to chip away, to scrape it. If you've ever been around ice that's, that's, that's there and it's been hardened because the, it's been so cold for so long, that can be difficult. He said, or you could light a fire in the fireplace and you could heat from within and that ice would melt. And he uses that illustration to describe what gentleness can do in the lives of others. There might be times when just being gentle or being meek which indicates having that power under control, that you're, that you're under control of, of your emotions and, and your language when you're talking to someone and you have an earnest desire to see that they're restored and you care about them. And that kind of approach can melt that ice. I also heard an illustration years ago that I've never forgotten about a man who was seeking to give medicine to his dog. He had a big dog and he lived out in the country. And he decided that his dog needed to have some castor oil. And so if you've ever tried to give medicine to a dog that doesn't want to take medicine, you know that can be a challenge. And so he had never done this before, but he had his little uh, bottle there. And so he just thought, well, I'll just grab my dog here. And so he sort of had him and, and was opening his mouth and trying to put that in. And that dog was fighting him the whole way. And he was trying to hold that dog, but the dog was more powerful than him. And they went back and forth until finally that dog wrestled free and knocked the bottle out of his hands and it fell on the floor and the castor oil spilled everywhere. And the man was so frustrated, he just had to go sit down. And as he sat down, he looked over and saw the dog going up and licking the castor oil that had come out of that bottle. You know, sometimes it's not the content of what we're saying, but it's the approach that we use that makes all the difference. It might be that you could say something that's difficult to say, that's really hard. You could point to someone and they're dealing with sin in life and you could point that out and you could do it very specifically and very poignantly. But if you say it with gentleness, if you say it the right way, it could be understood much better than if you tried to force it down someone's throat. And so there's this collective responsibility. We bear one another's burdens, but we're also called to restore one another. And that purpose of restoration, if you think about it, it's, it's like when you break a bone and you know the care that goes into setting that bone and to putting the cast on and making sure that it's set. And if it's aligned properly, that healing can be complete. But if it's not aligned properly, we know what happens. And so it's important to do that. But it's also important, as Paul would say, to bear your own load. And that might seem a little bit like a contrast. We bear each other's burdens, but we bear our own load. How does that work? And yet there are two different terms at work here. The first would indicate more of a weight, kind of like an overwhelming burden. And the second has been compared to a soldier's pack or cargo for a ship. In other words, the first is kind of like an overwhelming weight that you just crumble under the weight of it, but the second is like a soldier's pack that's taken when he goes into battle with the supplies that you need to work. And I like that imagery because that imagery reminds me that when we're dealing with a burden that would overpower us on our own, we have the help to, to deal with that and to face that challenge. But every one of us, as a soldier, has our own pack. The soldier imagery is used by Paul several times in the New Testament. We've got this idea that all of us have a role. All of us have a mission. Each of us has a load to carry. As Christians, we all have a responsibility. And so I have to ask myself, if I've found that responsibility, am I bearing my own load? Am I fulfilling my responsibility? Do I have a talent that I could use for God that I haven't yet used? Do I have a ministry idea that I haven't yet shared with anybody? Something that, that this church could be involved in that I haven't yet brought up? What do I have that I can use? 
And I would encourage you this morning, if you haven't done that, think about ways that that you can bear your load. Think about creative ways. You can use what God has given you to reach out to others. When we think about the load that we have, sometimes our load can keep us going. There's an old parable told about a grandfather clock that sat in the same corner of the same house for three generations. For over a hundred years, it would tick off minutes and hours and days. It never missed a beat. But yet, when the recent owner passed, it was sold at auction. And the new owner took it home and was looking to see what made it tick. And instead of seeing a winding key, he saw a heavy weight that had been it had to be pulled at the top of the clock to keep it running. And he saw how heavy that weight was and how old the clock was. And he said, it shouldn't have to bear that kind of heavy weight. And so he took it off and the clock stopped. And because this is a fable, because this is a story, uh, this was a clock that talked back to its owner. And the clock said, why did you take my weight? And the owner said, well, to lighten your burden. And the clock said, well, put it back. It's the only thing that keeps me going. Sometimes our weight, sometimes our, our pack that we have is what keeps us going. You can probably relate to that. There's probably a service that, that you do, a ministry that you're a part of that keeps you going. There's probably something you do every week that keeps things moving for you, that keeps you growing spiritually. As Christians, when we're serving God, that really keeps us going. And so we have to remember to bear our own load. And we also examine ourselves. That's another part of what Paul is saying here. You examine yourself. You see, it's important if we're going to help others... If we're going to try to restore others, that we only do so after we've examined ourselves. If I'm going to try to help bear one another's burdens, I've got to make sure that I have my own life right. The way Jesus describes it in Matthew chapter 7, in the first six verses, he paints this humorous picture of someone trying to remove a speck from someone else's eye with a huge log or a huge plank in his own eye. And verse 5 says, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Notice Jesus doesn't absolve them of the responsibility of helping others. He's still going to help his brother take the speck out of his eye, but he can only do it after he's examined himself. And so when we think about our collective responsibility to help one another, to restore each other, that can only happen if we've examined ourselves. So the collective responsibility can only happen if I'm doing my individual responsibility, my individual job of making sure that my life is in line. It's that principle that they talk about in an airplane, putting on your own gas mask in case of emergency before you help your other family members. If, if I'm not living right, I'm not going to be able to help those who are around me. And Paul wanted to make sure the Galatians weren't just comparing themselves to others, but they were examining themselves. It's easy to fall into that comparison trap. If you would turn over to Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells this parable of a Pharisee that compares himself with a publican or a tax collector. I was reminded of that this week at our future ministers camp. We were dealing with parables, and this was one of those parables. And I'll begin reading in verse 9. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. You see what's happening there? Because they had a picture of themselves as being righteous, they started viewing others with contempt. If they had examined themselves, I wonder if that would change the way they viewed others. In verse 10, Jesus said, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Did you see the difference there in comparison? It could be someone who says, the first thing out of his mouth is, I thank you, I'm not like other people. Jesus said that we find that they viewed themselves righteously, so they viewed others with contempt. And in Galatians chapter 6, 
Paul reminds us that if we examine ourselves first, then we can relate to others. But if we don't do that, if I think too highly of myself, then I'm not going to be able to relate to others. And so you have this difference. Do I say, thank you, I'm not like other people? Or do I say, be merciful to me, a sinner? There's a world of difference between the two. And Jesus only pointed out one as an example of a man who went home justified. I need to think of myself in a way that is honest, in a way that allows me to really examine my heart. It would have been easy for those who were coming in to the church at Galatia and who were Judaizers trying to convert them to this idea of both the old law and the new law. It would have been easy for them to compare themselves to Gentiles who hadn't grown up the way they had, who didn't have the knowledge that they had or the background that they had and think highly of themselves. Or it would have been easy for Gentile Christians to think more highly of themselves because it was all these Jewish Christians that were getting caught up in keeping the old law and the new law. But we're reminded here that we don't think more highly of ourselves than other people. We have this understanding of who we are, an attitude of humility. And humility doesn't mean we think less of ourselves, that we're down on ourselves. It just means we think of ourselves less. We examine ourselves and we know who we are. We know what we've done. We're honest with ourselves. And then we can be focused on others rather than viewing them with contempt, as we see in Luke chapter 18. We've probably all seen a a, a situation like this where you have uh, two children sitting at the dinner table. Maybe they're siblings and... uh, Little sister is pointing to her big brother and saying, oh, look at that. He hasn't eaten all his food and she's still got all of her food left on her plate. Have you ever seen something like that? Look at that. Oh, you've got to get on to him or you've got to get on to her. I know probably none of us have ever done that before, but surely we've seen that somewhere. It's humorous when we see a child doing that, but it's not so funny spiritually when we see people pointing out flaws in others without dealing with their own lives. In fact, it's incredibly discouraging. And as we read through Galatians chapter 6, we're reminded how important it is to give preference to one another in honor. That's the way Paul put it when he wrote to the Romans in Romans 12 and verse 10, that you give preference to one another, that you treat one another as, as more, high, more highly than you treat yourself, that you're respecting them. And so I have to ask myself, both the individual and collective responsibilities, am I being responsible? Am I fulfilling my responsibilities as Christians? Or as as a Christian? Are we fulfilling our responsibilities as Christians? Are there people that are struggling with the burden that I need to help? Is there someone caught up in a sin that I need to go to in a spirit of gentleness and meekness and help them be restored? Is there something in my own life that I need to examine, that I need to confront? Is there something in my life I need to be doing? Is there service that needs to be taking place that I'm not currently doing? All these are important questions. And all these are prompted by these first five verses of Galatians chapter 6. It is easy to try to shift responsibility. It's easy to try to shift blame. It may even be described as human nature to try to get out of our responsibility, but it's not God's nature. And so this morning, I want to challenge us with that question. Am I being responsible? And it may be that in your life, there are things as you examine yourself that need to be changed. It could be that you need to become a Christian, that you need to respond in faith, a faith that follows up on a, on a, a statement uh, that is belief in Jesus Christ, and it follows up with obedience and submission to His will, that confesses His name, that turns your life around, and you put Him on in baptism, and you begin walking a life where you're individually examining yourself and carrying your own load, but you're helping your brothers and sisters. It could be that you're crumbling this morning under the weight of a burden. And you need your brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside you and help you through that time. If there's any way we can help you, please come as we stand and as we sing together. Great Mirror Church of Christ is a congregation of Christians who believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Following the New Testament pattern, we're trying to meet the needs of the people in this community and throughout the world. We invite you to worship with us at Graymere Church of Christ, which meets at 1320 Trotwood Avenue in Columbia, Tennessee.
you'll always receive a warm welcome. If you have a question or comment about today's program, call 931-388-4796. We hope you will join us again next week as we study the Bible.